With their hands in the soil, on the lakes and across the open expanses. Here, scientists are investigating what is going on right now, right here. Because the Earth is getting warmer, and in Sweden we have unique opportunities to see what is going to happen with the rest of the world. Sweden is like a peephole into the future. The water here is heating up. The snow is melting. The permafrost is thawing. Maybe through this we can catch a glimpse of a looming global catastrophe. Or that it will not be so dangerous, just longer summers and warmer swims. The answers are hiding in our mountains and in our forests. Here lies a bomb buried. But is it lying safe here underground, dormant, and far from any risk of being set off? Or is it the other way around, that it is threatening to explode with full force and consequences for the whole Earth and all life on it? This is what Ellen Doropol is looking to answer. When I stick a, a rod in the ground, like here, I cannot come any deeper than about 30 centimeters. And that's not because there's a rock down there, but it's because the soil is solid frozen. So I can simply not go further than to where it's frozen. And uh, it's the end of June now. The fact that it is still frozen is because it stays frozen the whole year round. It's what we call permafrost. Spread out over large portions of the northern part of the globe, and everywhere on Earth, near the poles and in high mountains, is the world's permafrost. But the dead vegetation here has been kept frozen, and therefore the greenhouse gases haven't been able to be released. They are still locked in here, but as the ground thaws, these greenhouse gases are set free. And there is a lot of carbon dioxide hiding down there. So, if you would take all the CO2 that is in the whole atmosphere of the world and you do it twice, that is the amount of organic carbon that we have in permafrost. And so people are afraid that if this carbon that is in permafrost um, is not stored there anymore because it is thawing, and microbes start degrading it and produce CO2 and methane, it ends up in the atmosphere. And that would mean that we end up with a CO2 level in the atmosphere that is three times as high as we have it now. And in, as a consequence of that, it would get much warmer on our planet. This is what might be the bomb. Carbon dioxide in the ground. Ellen's job is to estimate how much of the carbon dioxide could be released and how quickly. And what matters most is which life form will thrive best in the thawing soil. Microorganisms that unleash carbon dioxide, or new plants that can bind up the carbon to ensure the emissions are more gradual. In that case, we have a balance that is positive for us in the sense that the system will take up more extra CO2 than that it releases. But if the microbes have a good time and they really like this new material that is released from the frost, then it might be a balance where actually there's much more CO2 released into the atmosphere than taken up. It's my goal to understand how this balance works out and how they interact. As for the basic principles of the greenhouse effect, we have a pretty good grasp of the concept. And we would not survive without it. The atmosphere sees to it that the sun's heat is retained. But now we've messed up. Our production of greenhouse gases 
particularly carbon dioxide from all the fossil fuels, coal, and oil, has resulted in the atmosphere retaining even more of the sun's heat. This adds to the greenhouse effect, and temperatures increase. The basic principle is simple, but then it gets more complicated. Because the warming itself triggers thousands of other processes, which in turn can cause even greater warming or cooling of the Earth. And it is these new effects yet to be understood that many researchers in Sweden now want to learn about. A warmer world offers no easy answers. One could think that more heat will result in raising the tree line. It's the cold up there that holds them back. But it isn't necessarily so easy. Here, the forest has not climbed up the mountainside. Instead, totally the opposite has occurred. A small moth called the peppered moth is a constant threat to the birch trees. One warm winter a few years ago did not kill the eggs and the larvae from these moths, as is usually the case. Instead, the pepper moth thrived and a large portion of birches died. Maya Sundquist and David Wardle are trying to do precisely that which is so hard. To predict what will happen to the vegetation on a warmer earth on a hotter mountain. Okay, sat down. Yeah, that's, that's what I saw last time. And, uh... So what you'll see is you'll go over this ridge and then you'll see the stream. Yes. This stream. Mm -hmm. And there's a snowbed following it on the right side. Maya and David have test beds up the mountain slope. They come here once a year. Down in the valley, it is hot, but the higher they hike, the colder it gets. The attraction is that the, um, it's a gradient that represents a range of temperature. And the range of temperature it represents is about three or four degrees Celsius, which is about the same as what we'd expect um, in terms of climate change and, and global warming over the next um, few decades. What will happen to the vegetation here is extraordinarily difficult to say conclusively. It is a complex interplay. It is about which plant it is, how much of the nutrients nitrogen and phosphorus plants need and can get, and of course, the temperature. All this determines which plants will have the opportunity to flourish and which ones will have a harder time. The plants are already here and these scientists can study the effects of future temperature increases by choosing different altitudes along the mountainside. The researchers control the nutrient concentrations themselves. So what you see, maybe even from over there, is the really strong responses of grasses. All of this you know, beige, brown, dead litter is grass from last year. So quite a strong shift in, in plant community. Uh, composition. If the plant growth diminishes here, like in the dead birch forests, it can be bad. But if more growth comes, that can be positive news. Our Swedish mountain world can then become a so-called carbon sink, which binds carbon dioxide and keeps the earth cooler. There are already indications where it will go, among other places for the heaths, the large parts of the mountains, which spread out in a shrub-like carpet. This is of course speculating, but from what we've seen of measurements along this gradient in a recently started experiment, 
is that both at the lowest elevation in heath vegetation, so at 500 meters, and then up at a site at 900 meters there, these systems are still a carbon sink. And that's even one year into artificially warming plots at each elevation as well. Um, so, so far, all of those plots are carbon sinks regardless of temperature treatment. On a warmer planet, things will grow differently. There will be less growth in already hot areas, but more here. And all that grows affects the waters. Simply stated, as more plants and small animals die, their waste drains into lakes, making them darker. They become richer in what is known as humus. This makes it more difficult to get drinking water from the lakes. We already know this. But now the question is, what happens to the life in the lakes as they darken? David Sikel has just moved from the U.S. to Umeå in order to implement one of the largest scale experiments ever carried out on a lake. I want to know how the changing water color impacts the fish populations in lakes. And I'm going to test this by experimentally changing the color of an entire lake. For David, the question is how it will go for pike and perch in the lakes here. Will they survive the climate bang? To get solid answers, the kind that may apply to lakes over much of the northern hemisphere, David needs to do the experiments on the largest of scales. I want to do this experiment at such a big scale because uh, ecosystems are complex, and if you simplify them and with small-scale studies, they often come to the incorrect or even opposite results of what happens in real life. Um, so because of this, um, whole ecosystem scale experiments like this are really where most of the big advances in understanding lakes and rivers come from. There's two different ways I might darken the lake. The first is to pump water from the lake onto the top of the mire, and when it sinks through, the mire is very dark and has lots of organic material, and the water will flush that from the mire back into the lake. Uh, the other way is to get pumper trucks and pump in water from other dark systems, and then pump that into the truck and drive it up to the lake and discharge it in, and that would also darken the lake. The experiment will continue for at least three years, during which the lake's natural light penetration, oxygen, levels of nutrients, and above all, aquatic life, will be constantly monitored. And so far, David has no positive expectations for what the results will be. I think that the fish populations will decline dramatically. Um, so fish like perch and pike uh, that are common in these lakes. And what I want to know is um, how rapidly that happens. So if there's any way to, to slow it down or to prevent that change from happening. Researchers are traveling here to get from Sweden an understanding of the fever that the world will suffer. And there are scientists here who are reaching out around the Earth. Orjan Gustafsson has been on expeditions to the seas north of Siberia to measure emissions from those thawing seafloors there 
in the same way that our Swedish mountain biome does as the permafrost thaws. His new project covers all of Southeast Asia. He is studying the so-called brown cloud. Yes, uh, I guess maybe I'm talking a little bit uh, about the brown cloud at home. Uh, so one day my, my three-year-old son Eric came home from daycare and said, here dad, here is your brown cloud. This brown cloud is nothing to play with. Over India, Nepal, Thailand and China, it consists of soot particles from everything that burns. Coal in power plants, wood in stoves, diesel buses, farm fires across the fields. The color of the vast snow fields is getting darker with major consequences. For totally white snow reflects the sunlight efficiently and sends out light and thus heat into space. But the now darker snow absorbs the sun's heat and the whole area gets warmer. This is like putting a turbocharger on the greenhouse effect. Scientists estimate that the soot warms this area far more than the elevated carbon dioxide. 20 times more, to be specific. Orion's team wants to understand which generators of emissions in which locations are the worst. We're focusing on the soot particles, which is uh, the worst component of the brown cloud. It can come from different combustion processes, from traffic, from uh, coal combustion power plants, from wood fuel usage in, uh, in households. And when we have that information, we provide that as a scientific underpinning for political decisions on where to put the biggest efforts to mitigate, decrease the emissions. To make the map of emissions, Orion and the team take samples from monitoring stations all over Southeast Asia, India, China, where filtered collections of what the air contains are gathered. These are pictures from the measuring station in the Maldives, far out in the Indian Ocean. The filters are then sent for analysis in Stockholm, like this filter here. This is a high volume filter sample of air particles collected in the northern Indian Ocean with no local pollution. So these are air particles that have transported with winds from northern India and Bangladesh. Despite the enormous emissions, and that it takes time to sort out which emissions are the worst, Orion is hopeful, as countries have already begun to take the brown cloud seriously. Uh, and there are programs for this, both in India and China, and uh, uh, it's, ha it's happening. And uh, one of the reasons uh, is that it helps uh, climate and public health, and the effect is largest nearest to where you do this action. We are entering a world where that which is going to happen is shrouded in mystery. But even so, scientists are learning more every day. The climate is one of the biggest areas of research today and one of the largest we have ever known and will continue to be. And the researchers we have met here are now doing everything they can to provide answers about that big change that's coming. For there is one thing they are all already sure of today. The world of tomorrow will look different. <laughs>